My name is Clark Murdoch. I'm a senior advisor here at CSIS. I'm the director of the Project on Nuclear Issues. Uh, this is our third session of Pony Debates the Issues. Uh, topic is a very relevant one. Uh, resolved the United States should ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. It was the only issue on which the recently released report from the U.S. Congressional Commission on the U.S. Strategic Posture, otherwise known as the Perry Schlesinger Commission, it was the only topic on which they could not agree. Uh, and so in there, I'm sure that our debaters have been cribbing their lines from it already. There is a text box on why we should ratify and a text box on why we shouldn't and a long, careful argument on why it was they couldn't reach an agreement on this particular issue. So it's uh, with great pleasure that I welcome our debaters tonight. Uh, Daryl Kimball, who will be speaking in the affirmative, the executive director of the Arms Control Association, uh, lead editor of Arms Control uh, Today, and a, a very familiar voice to us all who have followed these debates. And Steve Rademacher, who has been in many different positions in government. Uh, as I was reading his resume, I realized that there's somebody who's even more of a Washington hack than I am uh, in terms of how many jobs he's lost here in uh, uh, Washington. But uh, this vast experience is one that has done very well for me, and I know has done very well for Steve as well. Uh, it's with great pleasure I welcome both Daryl and Steve tonight and introduce you to the moderator, uh, Chris Jones, a research assistant here at CSIS. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about the format really quickly before we begin. We've changed the format a little bit from the previous debates, uh, although it's close. What we're going to have, each side is going to give an opening statement of seven minutes. Uh, we're going to try to enforce that. I'm going to knock on the table uh, when there's a minute left and then uh, try as, as politely as possible to make sure we stay within time limits, uh, after which there will be a cross-examination period where the person cross-examining the other side will ask three one-minute questions and the person will be given a one-minute response. Then there will be a moderator session where I ask each side one question and they respond, and then there will be closing arguments. Uh, and after of all of that, which we're hoping we can get in in 45 minutes, we'll have some audience Q&A. Uh, so we're going to start with the affirmative, Mr. Kimball, uh, his opening statement. Thank you very much, Chris, Clark, CSIS, and uh, thanks, everyone, for being here on this beautiful night uh, to talk about such an important topic. It's exciting to see so many people interested in the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which has been uh, a national objective of the United States for five decades. Today we face new and old nuclear weapons dangers, and the CTBT is more important than ever for U.S. global security. In a nutshell, let me outline some of the reasons why. The CTBT's prohibition on all nuclear test explosions constrains the ability of nuclear armed states to perfect new and more sophisticated nuclear bombs. So without testing above several kilotons, sophisticated nuclear weapon states cannot gain confidence in the performance or reliability of new thermonuclear weapon designs, nor new directed energy weapons uh, such as X-ray lasers. In China's case, for instance, a new round of nuclear weapon test explosions would allow it to miniaturize warhead designs and allow it to put multiple warheads on its relatively small strategic missile arsenal. That's the kind of move that could allow China to rapidly increase its nuclear strike capability and something that we should be uh, doing everything we can uh, to avoid. In the case of India and Pakistan, U.S. ratification of the CTBT would, of course, not prevent the expansion of the size of those two countries' nuclear arsenals but it would prevent them from developing smaller, more sophisticated thermonuclear bombs in the years ahead, and it would help head off further Indo-Chinese arms competition. Without testing, states like Iran would not be able to proof test the more advanced warheads that would be necessary to put on top of uh, ballistic missiles. Um, but it would prevent uh, states like Iran from developing the smaller, more sophisticated warheads uh, necessary to do that. Um, U.S. ratification of the CTBT, I believe, would also put the spotlight on Iran's position on the CTBT. If it doesn't ratify, it will cast further doubt on Iran's claim that its nuclear program is peaceful, and it will help the United States and others rally international uh, pressure on, on Tehran to curtail its sensitive nuclear activities. Now, just as importantly, 
What does that mean? Five minutes, wonderful. All right. We'll be bombing in five minutes, yes. Okay, the U.S. ratification, of course, would reestablish our role as a world leader. It would give us the leverage that we desperately need to call on others to take on new nonproliferation obligations and pave the way for the kind of action we need in the 2010 NPT Review Conference uh, to strengthen the, the beleaguered nuclear nonproliferation treaty. Without U.S. ratification at that conference or at the year, in the years ahead, we will be working with one, maybe two hands tied behind our back as we try to repair and revive the global nonproliferation system. So, as John McCain said uh, in the 2008 presidential uh, campaign in a speech in Los Angeles, it is time to take another look at the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Now, during the brief debate before the U.S. Senate in 99, many senators who voted no, of course, expressed concerns about the ability of the United States to maintain its arsenal in the absence of testing and to verify compliance with the treaty. That was then, and this is now. In the past decade, the Stockpile Stewardship Program has matured. It's proven that it works extremely well. Advances with the program include great leaps forward in advanced computing, 3D X-ray radiography, and studies to demonstrate that demonstrate that the plutonium pits that are part of all of the U.S. nuclear warhead types are not affected by aging for a century or more. That was one of the major concerns a decade ago about nuclear warheads. Critics of the CTB uh, will have you believe, however, that maintaining the reliability of proven U.S. nuclear warhead designs still depends on a program of nuclear test explosions. That has never been true in the, in the past. Only a handful of U.S. nuclear test explosions were ever conducted for uh, warhead reliability purposes, and it's certainly not the case today. Contrary to the assertions made by some, uh, especially in the past uh, three or four years, the Stockpile Stewardship Program is working. The U.S. nuclear arsenal has and will continue to be maintained through non-nuclear tests and evaluations, combined with the replacement, remanufacture, reuse of key components to previous design specifications. And as many of you know, since 1994, each warhead type in the U.S. nuclear weapons arsenal has been determined to be safe and reliable through a rigorous certification process conducted by the weapons labs. So as a result of all this, of this experience over the past uh, more than a decade, we know more today about the U.S. nuclear weapons arsenal than we ever did during the nuclear testing days. Confidence in the ability to maintain warheads is increasing at a faster rate than the uncertainties that the scientists uh, may have. Now, with all that in mind, we have to keep a couple other things in mind. For better or worse, U.S. ratification does not mean that the testing option is forever closed off to the United States. As General John Shelley Kajvili said in his, his very excellent 2001 report on the CTBT, uh, the Senate might insist on a once every 10 years review of the treaty. And in the extremely unlikely event that the United States ever decides it needs to test, the CTBT's Supreme National Interest Clause, of course, provides an out. And as we've seen during the Bush administration, uh, the United States has indeed exercised its right to withdraw from major treaties. I'm thinking of the ABM Treaty in particular. On verification, we, have now, now we now have layers and layers of national, international, and civilian monitoring capabilities that provide high confidence that any militarily significant test by another country will be detected. Over the past decade, the international monitoring system that's part of the CTBT uh, regime uh, has been built up considerably. It was just beginning in 1999. Today, some 280 out of the total of 337 monitoring stations have been constructed, and most of those are sending data back. Uh, that array includes highly capable noble gas monitoring uh, stations. Daryl, what the hell are noble gas monitoring stations? Those are extremely sensitive stations that can detect the telltale radioactive gases that are emitted by underground nuclear explosions and have already proven their worth during the 2006 experience with North Korea's test. Now, during the debate in 1999, some critics claimed the IMS could only monitor for underground explosions at yields at or above one kiloton TNT equivalent and that U.S. national capabilities were not much better. Well, maybe that was true in 1959. It wasn't true in 1999, and it certainly isn't true in 2009. In reality, actual nuclear test monitoring capabilities were much better uh, in 1999 and have only improved since then. 
The evasion scenarios imagined by the critics were unrealistic and beyond the capabilities of the states that might benefit from them. We've heard about various cheating scenarios from CTP critics. We've been hearing about these claims for years. What we have to keep in mind uh, are some key facts. China, Russia, India, and Pakistan cannot conduct tests above about 10 tons uh, TNT equivalent in yield at their test sites without a substantial risk of detection. And lower yield tests are not of significant enough military value to outweigh the high risk of detection. So all in all, we have to look at the issues again in fresh light. We have to look at the facts in, in, uh, afresh. As former Secretary of State George Shultz said last month, speaking to his, his uh, fellow Republicans, uh, they might have been right in voting against the CTB some years ago, but they would be right voting for it now based upon these new facts. So before I close, there are four bottom line conclusions that I want us to keep in mind as we go through uh, the debate tonight. One, the United States can maintain a safe, secure, and reliable nuclear weapons stockpile without additional testing. It is U.S. policy not to test already. We have signed the treaty. We have a legal obligation not to violate the purpose or intent of the treaty. The CTBT ratification would not affect current or planned stockpile work. And whatever concerns we might hear tonight or in the months ahead about evasion scenarios, the United States' capability to detect and respond to possible clandestine testing by other states will be significantly greater with the CTBT than without. Two, foreign nuclear weapons programs pose a far greater threat to U.S. security without a CTB than with a CTB. Absence of the treaty, other states could develop and test new or improved weapons without constraints. Three, ratification of the CTB by the U.S. will prompt other states including China, to ratify. And it's going to put pressure on others like India, Iran, Israel, and Pakistan, producing what I believe and many others believe will be a domino type of effect. There are some states that might hold out longer still, in which case the U.S. and others should explore, and they can, provisional entry into force down the line, provisional entry into force of the treaty down the line. Four, and finally, there is neither the political support, the technical need, the military necessity for renewed U.S. nuclear weapons testing. And of course, it's in our national security interest to prevent other countries from conducting nuclear test explosions. Though we have already assumed most responsibilities and obligations of a CTBT ratifying state, we simply cannot reap the full security benefits of the CTB until the Senate approves the treaty by a two-thirds majority. These are not just my judgments. These are some of the reasons why prominent Republicans, such as Secretary Schultz, Brent Scowcroft, Linton Brooks, believe the time has come finally for the United States to reconsider and ratify the CTB. To do otherwise is self-defeating, it's damaging, and is not in our national security interests. Pleasure to be here. I, um, I'm going to make two threshold points about, um, the, about the debate this evening and then go on to point out what I consider to be three fatal flaws of the uh, Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. The, um, the first threshold point I want to make is, uh, and, and this may be the most important point of the whole evening, the burden of proof in this debate is on the proponents. Uh, when, you, when you hear public discourse on this, uh, they try to turn it around, and they, they, they often put the question, what's wrong with this? Please explain what's wrong with the CTPT. I, I didn't marry my wife because I couldn't think of anything wrong with her. Uh, I married her <laughs> because I thought there were things right about her. And um, I think the same concept should apply to Congress when it considers legislation and when, considers, when the Senate considers the approval of treaties. It needs to be persuaded not just that there's nothing wrong with them, but, there's a, but it, beyond that, that there's actually something right about them. And so um, I'm going to go on and identify three fatal flaws that I believe exist. Even, even if Daryl or, or others can absolutely, uh, to your satisfaction, refute those concerns that I express, that, that still is not enough to lead to the conclusion that the United States should ratify, because beyond that, there's still the burden to establish that going forward, the CTBT is in the interests of the United States. 
second threshold point I want to make is uh, th there's a very serious uh, question whether the United States can live under a permanent test ban and remain a credible nuclear weapons power over the long term. And by long term, I mean you know, not three years, five years, I mean 20 years, 50 years. Uh, Daryl got into this issue a bit in his remarks, uh, but the reality is neither Daryl nor I are experts on, on this issue. The best we can do is cite people, cite studies, cite, cite authorities uh, who are experts. Uh, and, and I'm sure Daryl has a, a, a pile of quotes there that, that he can read to you if, if you want to hear them. I have, I have quotes too, and I, I can read them to you. Uh, I, I don't propose to do that because uh, I think your takeaway in the audience, if, if we go through that process, is uh, your conclusion will be the experts are divided. There are experts that go both ways on this question of whether uh, it's sustainable over the long term to rely solely on stockpile stewardship programs uh, and maintain credibility, uh, the, the credible belief that, that you have nuclear weapons that will work. For the rest of this evening, though, I'm going to proceed under the assumption that, that we can live under a permanent test ban. Okay? So I, I propose not to debate that. And I want to focus instead on the proposed test ban that's before us. Uh, not, not the concept of a, a permanent test ban, but the particular treaty that's been negotiated, so the comprehensive test ban treaty. And as I said, I believe there are three fatal flaws, fatal defects in this comprehensive test ban treaty, any one of which by itself would uh, warrant rejection of this treaty by the United States Senate. Those three fatal flaws are first, it is unverifiable. Second, there's disagreement among the parties to this treaty about what the treaty prohibits. In other words, there's no actual meeting of the minds among the parties. Uh, and then third, uh, the treaty has a defective entry into force provision, which guarantees that this treaty will never enter into force by its terms. First, unverifiability. Uh, again, Darrell got into this in his remarks. That there is a debate among the experts. And, and in this area, the experts are physicists, geologists, seismologists. There's a, and there's a debate among these experts about uh, the extent to which verification of the Comprehensive Test Ban uh, Treaty will be affected, um, or can be affected. Uh, the National uh, Academy of Sciences in 2002 issued what, what I think it intended to be a pro-CTBT report, uh, but in this regard, its, its conclusion was not very reassuring. It, it basically said uh, up to two, t two kiloton tests, uh, well, it said above two kilotons, absolutely we can detect. Below that, less clear. So uh, you know, Daryl asserts that, that capabilities are much uh, greater in this area, but the National Academy of Sciences uh, was, was not as confident. And they, and as I say, they were trying to write a pro CTBT report. Uh, there's a debate on you know, whether it's one kiloton, whether it's less than one kiloton. But there is no debate on this point that there is no verification mechanism that can detect down to the minimum, or the bottom line level that's prohibited under the CTBT, because it's the, the U.S. interpretation of CTBT anyway is that zero yield. There can be no nuclear weapons test of any device that generates a nuclear yield. Note that you will find no expert who will contend that the, the international monitoring system or any other monitoring system can detect down to that threshold. The debate is how close can you get to zero, but no one will say you get to zero. So when, when you pursue this, what you will find, and, and I suspect it will happen this evening, is the debate then morphs into a debate about, well, okay, maybe there can be testing at some low level that is undetectable, unverifiable. Uh, is it militarily significant? And proponents of the treaty, what they will tell you, and, and you see it in the, in the strategic posture report last week, uh, they'll tell you, well, okay, maybe, maybe there's some testing that's not detectable, but it, it can't be militarily useful. And, and that's, that's the assertion that they make. I'll return to this point in a moment. The second fatal flaw is that there's disagreement among the parties of the CTBT about what it prohibits. The treaty says in Article 1, Paragraph 1, the following, each state undertakes not to carry out any nuclear weapon test explosion or any other nuclear explosion. So what is a nuclear weapon test explosion or a nuclear explosion? These terms are not defined in the treaty. I've already told you what the U.S. interpretation is. The U.S. interpretation is that means zero nuclear yield. You can, you can do other types of tests, but if, if you do things that produce a nuclear yield, a yield of nuclear energy, that, that is what is prohibited under the treaty. Russia has a different interpretation. And consistent with Russia's interpretation, uh, they believe that they 
legally can conduct nuclear tests that, that the United States considers illegal and that we would not conduct ourselves under our interpretation of the treaty. The upshot of these two, these first two fatal flaws in the treaty is that the issue of compliance, I believe, will be a critical issue during Senate consideration of the CTBT. Uh, the Senate will want to hear what, what are the assessments, I guess most importantly of our intelligence community, about compliance with the treaty. And I, I think the, the question will actually be twofold. The first, on the first level will be, is, is Russia or any other country conducting tests that are, under, uh, that are illegal under our interpretation of the treaty? But then there'll be a further question, uh, and that is whether anyone is conducting any tests that are illegal under any interpretation of the treaty. In other words, even under the Russian interpretation, there are, are tests being conducted that would be illegal under that interpretation. I'm not here this evening to prejudge what our intelligence community will tell the Senate when it asks these questions. Um, but if the answer to either one of those questions is yes, that either tests are being conducted we consider illegal but other parties consider legal, or well, actually, tests are being conducted that under any t definition, any party's definition, are illegal, uh, then I, I think there will be um, serious concern in the Senate. And to the degree someone wants to contend that, well, these tests are not militarily useful, so we don't need to worry about them, I think uh, senators will be entitled to ask, if they're not militarily useful, why is any country going to the trouble, spending the very considerable amounts of money it costs to conduct these tests, and running the, the enormous political risks of being caught, it, all for, for tests that we are assured by proponents of the treaty are not militarily useful. Now, something interesting happened last week. The Strategic Posture Commission issued its report, and there, there was a debate in that report, and proponents set forth their view of the CTPT, and the opponents set forth their view. The opponents said something that I had not previously seen before in print. They said, other countries with different interpretations of the treaty could conduct tests with hundreds of tons of nuclear yield. Apparently, Russia and possibly China are conducting low yield tests. That was stated. Uh, I served on a commission like this recently. You know, we had to submit, I, I, don't, I didn't serve on this commission. We had to submit our report for declassification review, and the intelligence community excised any assertions that they, they thought uh, revealed classified information or. or they brought to our attention assertions that they thought were incorrect. Uh, you will note that the proponents who got to express their views in, in that report know where it took issue with this assertion. So if there is testing in the zone between the U.S. interpretation of the treaty, which is zero yield, and the Russian interpretation, which allows a test that apparently uh, render a, a nuclear yield, um, I think it will raise the question in the Senate of why we would why we would consider entering a treaty that's going to ap apply unequally to the parties, and where uh, under which we will be subject to the more restrictive interpretation that we've adopted for ourselves. Uh, obviously, if, if if there's the additional problem that, uh, that uh, the intelligence judgment is that there's currently nuclear testing going on above uh, the, the interpretation of, of uh, other parties, above above the uh, level of yield that they consider to be legal under the treaty. Um, there will be the even more profound question of why we would consider ratifying a treaty that other countries uh, are already cheating on by their own interpretations, their own definitions of, of uh, what's prohibited. The third fatal flaw of the CTBT is its entry into force mechanism, which, as I say, will guarantee that this treaty never enters into force. Uh, that mechanism set forth in the treaty requires the ratification of 44 specific countries. Um, Nine of those countries have not yet ratified. The United States is one of them. The glib answer, and I, and I think Daryl basically gave it to us this evening, is, well, that problem will be solved when the United States ratifies. The, the U.S. holding out on this treaty is a big impediment to enter into force. And, and once the United States sets an example, uh, the other countries uh, will follow along. I will, I will concede that that may be true in two cases. Uh, I think uh, China and Indonesia, which are also among the holdouts, um, may uh, feel in the wake of U.S. ratification that they should ratify as well. But there will still be six other holdouts. Uh, there will be India, Pakistan, Israel, Egypt, Iran, and North Korea. Um, and I, I submit that they are not going to be much persuaded or much influenced by uh, the U.S. decision to ratify or not ratify. Um, I want to make um, 
the further point in this connection, and that is this entry enforcement mechanism provided in the treaty makes absolutely no sense. I, 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 I'm sure there was a perfectly good reason why the negotiators came up with it, but it is completely illogical. This treaty, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, is only meaningful, legally meaningful, for countries that are not, that, that well, let me reverse that. It, it is not lead, legally meaningful for a country that is a non-nuclear weapon state under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. In other words, if you are a member of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and you already promised to give up permanently nuclear weapons, your further promise never to test a nuclear weapon is uh, superfluous. It, it's, uh, I mean, how could you test a nuclear weapon without having one? And if you had one, that means you had already violated a legal obligation that you have today. I, I know there may be an argument that some countries would violate one legal obligation but never think about, never consider violating two, but I, I think that's, that's kind of silly. Uh, there are arguably nine countries today that are not uh, non-nuclear weapon states. And um, the meaningful application of the CTBT is to those countries that either are allowed under the NPT to have nuclear weapons or that are not in the NPT and therefore, because they're outside the treaty, they're allowed to have nuclear weapons too. Um, so a sensible entry into force mechanism would require those countries for whom this treaty means something to ratify. It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have really asked other countries to expend, uh, required them to ratify in order to bring it into force. So let's take Iran as an example. Um, God forbid that eight of the nine remaining countries ratify and Iran is the ninth country. Because the CTBT then hands them an enormous club. <laughs> and we better believe Iran will use it. They will go to the international community and say, yeah, you know, we're prepared to ratify this treaty. We're, you know, we're already in the NPT and doesn't really mean anything, but we would go along. You know, you got to you got to let us alone on this Natanz thing uh, and our nuclear enrichment, uranium enrichment. Um, you've been you've been trying to deny us our treaty treaty rights under the NPT, and you let us alone. You give us a pass on enrichment and, and previous violations of our safeguards agreement, and then maybe we'll ratify the CTBT and bring it into force for you. But if you're not prepared to do that for us, then forget your your comprehensive test ban treaty. We, you know, this treaty gives us the right to block its entry into force, and we intend to block it until you give us what we want. Why the international community would want to hand Iran that kind of leverage uh, is beyond me. But that, that's what this treaty does. Now, you know, it's never going to come to that because there are other countries that are not going to ratify, uh, and so Iran will never be in the position to single-handedly hold it up. Egypt uh, is probably the single hardest case, and, and experts in this area will, will, will concede this. Egypt's position on the Comprehensive Test Ban is, is very straightforward. Uh, they will ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty when Israel ratifies not the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. It, it, that, that goes without saying that Israel would have to ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban before Egypt considers doing it. But in addition, they will not do it until Israel ratifies the NPT. And of course, Israel's position on that is, you know, we're waiting for success in the Middle East peace process, and then we'll take a look at ratifying a nuclear non-proliferation treaty. So um, the Egypt problem, best case, gets solved when we bring peace to the Middle East, and you know, you know how long we've been working on that. So just making the point, this, uh, this entry into force is never going to happen by the terms of the treaty. And I think Daryl basically conceded that a moment ago when he, when he said, uh, well, you know, what, what we'll have to do is consider something which he termed provisional entry into force. Um, you know, I guess that's the, the technically correct legal term for, for what's contemplated, but I, I have a different term for it, and that is amending the treaty. Uh, what, what they intend to do is amend the treaty, and I, I think we just heard one of the proponents say, we need to amend this treaty to bring it into force because the way it's actually stru currently structured, is, it's not going to ever enter into force. So um, I guess I'll, I'll leave with this thought, that if, if the actual plan to bring this treaty into force is to amend it down the road, why don't we, at the same time, fix the other fatal flaws in the treaty. Well, not at the same time. Why, why don't we, why, if, if, if that's what we need to do, let's fix all the problems at the same time, uh, starting with the fact that there is no agreed, uh, no agreement among the parties about what the treaty prohibits. Maybe that would be a good thing to fix, too, uh, if, if we were serious about uh, moving forward with the CTBT. Okay. Uh, the it's so now the affirmative cross-examination period, uh, which essentially means Daryl is going to ask uh, Mr. Rademacher three questions. Yeah, each side has a minute to ask a question, a minute to respond. I'm going to set the uh, alarmingly annoying timer for a minute, uh, and then silence only goes off. Uh, so to 
try to keep some semblance of time. So uh, hopefully within kind of the minute. Uh, Thank you. All right. Well, first of all, I think what we need to do in this debate tonight and the debate in the months ahead is we've got to be very careful not to cherry pick information coming out of NAS reports, intelligence assessments, et cetera. Let, let's just get one thing straight that um, Steve said before I ask the question I have for this in this round. What did the National Academy of Sciences say about detection levels? Uh, bear with me because these are scientists. They don't speak in plain English, but the National Academy of Sciences said, underground explosions can be reliably detected and identified as explosions using IMS data down to a yield of 0.1 kilotons, 100 tons, uh, in hard rock conducted anywhere in Europe, Asia, North Africa, and North America. For some locations, such as Russia's former nuclear test site in Novaya Zemlya, uh, the capability threshold is below 0.01 kilotons, 10 tons. Okay, that's a little different than one kiloton, okay? Now, some of the people who talk about the one kiloton threshold are talking about some pretty fantastic evasion scenarios involving uh, cavities, known as decoupling. Um, but, uh, I mean, these are the facts. And even with those evasion scenarios, uh, the, the, uh, the Russians would be extremely hard-pressed to, uh, to, uh, uh, to hide uh, any tests of, of, of military significance. So let's get back to one of the, the, the issues that you raised, Steve, which I think is, is an interesting one. Um, you say that uh, there's no agreed definition regarding permitted and prohibited activities under the CTB. Um, and then you go on to say that the Russians have apparently, you're citing the commission report, uh, engaged in low yield weapon test explosions, perhaps hydronuclear explosions. So let's just get the facts straight here, and I want to ask you about your interpretation of the negotiating record. All the CTB states parties understand that the CTB bans all nuclear test explosions. It's in Article 1 of the treaty. Um, furthermore, uh, U.S. Ambassador Steve Ledegar testified to the, to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in 1999. He said, I have heard some critics of the treaty seek to cast doubt on whether Russia in the negotiation of the treaty committed itself under treaty law to a truly comprehensive prohibition, um, including an explosion experiment event of even the slightest nuclear yield. Uh, did Russia agree to ban all nuclear test explosions? The answer, he said, is a categoric yes. The Russians, as well as other states, did commit themselves. All right. So there's other evidence from the Russians themselves in the, the debates of the CTB and the Russian Duma. Uh, the Russian negotiator uh, uh, has written in a 2006 article that hydronuclear experiments and all nuclear test explosions are prohibited by the treaty. So the bottom line is that Russia and other states' parties to the CTB understand clearly the CTB permits no explosions produced by sustained nuclear chain reactions. And I, I'm, I'm pretty incredulous about the insistence on, on this point, and the Posture Commission was presented with contrary evidence. I think they failed miserably uh, in, in taking into account that evidence. But that's another story. So in light of these facts, what is the, the basis for your claim that the states' parties don't agree uh, on what uh, the CTB prohibits, that the CTB prohibits all nuclear test explosions. And um, that's my question for now. Great. Uh, well, okay, if I only have one minute to respond, I'll respond only to, 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 the, <laughs> to the latter part. This format is... Uh, you know, I will, st <laughs> I will stipulate at the outset that, that Russia has signed and, and has ratified a treaty that says each state party undertakes not to carry out any nuclear weapon test explosion or any other nuclear explosion. And for Steve Ledegar to testify that Russia has promised not to carry out a nuclear weapon test explosion, quoting the language of the treaty, yeah, of course, they've done that. The, the question uh, is, uh, you know, am I wrong in asserting that they have a different definition of what is a nuclear weapon test explosion than we do? And um, for you to stand here and say that, well, the Strategic Posture Review Commission, would had, which had uh, incredible access to uh, available information uh, in carrying out its work, and, and has looked very, I mean, I, I know, uh, because I know some of the commissioners, they worked very hard on this issue. They, they looked into it, and uh, uh, you know, the, you, the, in the, the language of the proponents, you don't see them taking issue. I mean, the, the, the proponents of the CTBT, people like yourselves who served on that commission, got to write you know, a page and a half of arguments in favor of the treaty. The, uh, 
and they could respond to what the opponents were saying. They nowhere took issue with the assertion that Russia has a different interpretation. I, I think that that's significant. But, I mean, read it. You, I have a copy. I read it. There are two, there are two they positions. don't take issue with that. My question that, is, that is, what is the basis for your but, claim that they don't agree? I mean, where's, where's, where, where are the documents? I mean, where, where does this claim come yeah. from, or, or are we just citing the Posture Commission as the, the final You report? know, I, I will stand on what's in the Posture Commission report. Uh, I think it is interesting to look at the unanimous recommendation of the Posture Commission, which is that we get an agreed P5 statement on what is prohibited. Uh, in other words, provide the definition now that uh, the negotiators failed to achieve in, uh, in, in the CTBT negotiations. I was observed at one point I've held a lot of jobs in Washington. Many of those jobs are on Capitol Hill, and I was always a lawyer on Capitol Hill and um, uh, involved in drafting legislation. That was my responsibility. And, uh, you know, uh, a lot of times people to a parties to a negotiation disagree. And uh, but if, if there's a determination to achieve an outcome, there are ways of paper, papering over the dis disagreement. Uh, one of the most common ways is to come up with some, some term but then not agree on the definition of the term. Uh, and then just move forward on that basis, an agreement to disagree. Uh, the interested parties, they see some language, they interpret it differently, and they move on. When we're talking about domestic legislation, that's fine, because the upshot of that is that some court will get to, to interpret what the, what the language means, or an executive branch agency will get to interpret what the, what the language means. In the international context, when you're negotiating a treaty, and you have the negotiators default to ambiguous language upon which there's no agreed definition, uh, the upshot is each party is free to do what it wants. And um, I've already read the language uh, out of the, the Strategic Posture Commission report. Uh, there is the assertion there that uh, Russia's doing what it wants. So, um, you know, the, the, the Senate will, ha in its consideration of this treaty, the Senate will have access to, I don't, I don't mean to be evasive, but, you know, the, what the United States knows about nuclear testing is extraordinarily highly classified, and I don't propose to sit here this evening uh, as a former government official and uh, talk about everything that uh, I learned during my government service. Uh, that's why I quote uh, documents that have been through the declassification review process. Okay. Well, I would just suggest we go back and we look at the documents, and uh, it's pretty plain that there's agreement that no nuclear test explosions means no nuclear test explosions. Okay, well, my well, second well, question. Maybe I, well, okay. why, why, would this, why would the commissioners unanimously have said, before the, before the administration asked the Senate to give its advice and consent to this treaty, it should get an agreed statement out of the P5 about what is prohibited under this treaty. What the definition? I is. would not disagree that at this point. Why, why, why would their, the why, why would the commissioners have recommended that if this was not an issue? Well, because they couldn't agree on these these points. Uh, I would agree that at this point it would be useful to clarify this. Uh, but uh, rather than stand here and not not provide any evidence on, on, on your side, I mean, I think we need to go back to the to the facts. If it helps for the Russians to reiterate their position, the Chinese. Fine, but this is an issue that has been closed for a decade, and it's just an example of uh, the kind of arguments that uh, we're going to hear that are, are simply designed to raise doubts rather than uh, to uh, advance the, the conversation. But okay, so I, I will be moving on to the second question here. Um, so Steve has also made the the suggestion, uh, citing the, the Posture Commission report. Uh, that uh, the Russians uh, and the Chinese apparently are engaged in low-yield nuclear test explosions. Um, I've talked about the importance of looking at what is militarily significant, what is not. So I won't go over that again. Um, you've been in, in government and you've looked at the intelligence. We've been talking to people who are familiar with some of this intelligence too for years. We know how to talk about these issues and still respect the classification rules. Uh, it's clear that these reports that uh, the Posture Commission is basing its assertions on are old, they're not definitive, and they're technically flawed. Um, so we can't stand here and pull out the information uh, and, and, and look at it that the, the, the intelligence community has. We need to have a definitive assessment, uh, a new one, about these issues. But my question, Steve, is that given that during the, the George W. Bush administration, there were these allegations floating around. Um, why the George W. Bush administration, if these activities were militarily significant, 
to a really of such concern why the Bush administration did not publicly and apparently not even privately uh, take action to either clarify with the Russians what they were doing or to protest what we believe they were doing. And let me just remind everybody that this is not just based on what is in the classified realm, but in the May 2002 uh, edition of the New York Times, uh, there was a story that reported that the Bush administration secretly briefed members of Congress that Russia may be engaged uh, in uh, nuclear testing activities that violate the, the test ban. So my question is, is um, well, before I get to my question, if the Bush administration actually believed these were uh, militarily significant, they apparently didn't take action. It seems to me that George W. Bush uh, and his advisors have answered the question about whether this is militarily significant. Uh, it probably wasn't back then, and it probably isn't now. Um, so my question is whether you still insist that Russia um, is conducting these tests, these tests. What is the basis for this allegation? Uh, how old is this allegation? And finally, are we in a better position to address this potential problem by rejecting the CPD or by ratifying the Comprehensive Testing Treaty, given the tools that it gives us to follow up with confidence building measures and all site inspection? First of all, I, you know, I, I don't know why you would want to uh, challenge the competence or intelligence of the uh, members of the Strategic Posture Commission. They, uh, they were pretty serious people, and you know, many of them actually agree with you about the CTPT. Uh, and and I, I gather from, from your comments you're not happy with, the, with, with their work product. But I, I think uh, Some portion of their work product. I think when they went to work, uh, they, they intended to produce what, what you just called for, which was a definitive look at these questions. and. Uh, you know, I remind you, this is an unclassified report. Uh, and um, you know, to stand there and say, I want, to, I, I want to see the report, I want to see the document, I want to see the proof. Uh, I mean, I, have you ever, I guess you've never worked in government, but you think I can just produce that stuff because you asked for it? Uh, uh, I mean, look, these people looked at it. Answer my question. Okay. All right, rather than these, being these, accused, okay, well, answer my question, well, which is, I mean, I, I don't think it's very satisfactory. Position, I, I'm going to rely, I'm going to rely on the conclusions of the Strategic Posture Commission, okay. uh, and okay. again, I think they were diligent. I think they were serious people. They were, you know, <laughs> William Perry. I mean, I, if we know where he stands on the CTPT, you know, he signed on to to the recommendation that uh, we get a, an agreed statement out of the P5 about what is prohibited under this treaty, and he, he didn't take issue with the notion that that. That was just sort of a mindless exercise that, based on a faulty premise that there was a disagreement. Uh, likewise, on, on this question of, of uh, testing, uh, I served in the Bush administration. I'm not aware that with regard to challenging other countries' uh, compliance with the C compliance or lack thereof with the CTBT, that the Bush administration did anything differently than the Clinton administration before it. I mean, let's just be clear about what this report says, okay? You seem to be saying that Bill Perry is making the assertion that the Russians are conducting clandestine activities and that there's no definition. I'm saying he had okay. a chance. He that had a chance not, in, the, well, the, two, in, in expressing the views of the proponents to say, you know, the opponents are making a specious argument here that is absolutely unsupported by the uh, information that we, the proponents of this treaty on this commission, have had a chance to see. You, you can read this report in vain to find an assertion in that regard. To me, that so, speaks pretty loudly to, to I, I mean, I, I agree with you. Perry did not sign on to the statement, and I'll quote it again. Apparently, Russia and possibly China are conducting low-yield tests. Perry did not sign on to that. But given the chance, and he had the chance, he didn't say, that's an inane, absurd, ill-founded assertion by, by, the, by the opponents. He passed by that. Well, what Bill Perry and the, the pro-CTB group in the Posture Commission said, Fourth, the CTB is effectively verifiable. Concerns about militarily significant tests that might elude detection are overstated. Okay, that is that is addressing in a polite fashion the counterpoint section of the report on CTB. So please don't suggest that Bill Perry or others, uh, by not taking stronger issue in the report, uh, don't have issue with well, that. Read, read, read the language again. The, it's number four the in the pro yeah. in the pro section. Okay, the CTB is effectively verifiable. Concerns about military significant tests that might elude detection are overstated. And it goes on. 
th this is the point that I made earlier, that what the proponents do when forced, as I, th as I think ultimately Daryl's going to be, uh, when forced to concede that maybe tests are being conducted that are contrary to the U.S. interpretation of the treaty, uh, they will fall back to they're not militarily significant. And that, that, the language you just quoted, if you read it carefully, if you parse it, what, he, what he's saying is concerns about militarily significant testing are overblown. In other words, I mean, that, yes, that's an answer, but I mean, it, it, it's, it's not disputing the assertion. It's just characterizing it in a way that uh, they're more comfortable with it. I mean, just for the record, my question to you was, are we in a better position to deal with this kind of scenario with the treaty being ratified by the United States uh, or by the United States rejecting ratification of the CPD? I think uh, ratification by the United States will, will not uh, help in any way uh, in addressing these concerns because you, as of today, you have different, uh, it appears you have different interpretations. So why would one party say, you know, the, the interpretation that we had uh, at the time of negotiation and upon which we ratified this treaty, you don't like it, but you knew all along uh, that, that we had that interpretation and you accepted it when you ratified and no, we're not changing it. I, I think, so I, I mean, I think by, by ratifying now uh, with knowledge of this disagreement, we're essentially condoning it and perpetuating it. And again, wh why would we want to enter into a treaty that is going to apply differently among the parties and in our case, much more onerously than, uh, as a, than it will apply to the other parties? After, after we're done this evening, I would encourage uh, folks to go back and look at the statement from 2001 at the entry into force conference on the CTD in New York statement from the Russians uh, where they offered to pursue with the United States first additional transparency measures to test sites um, uh, as we move towards entering the force. Uh, that sounds like a very promising approach, but it requires the United States to ratify the treaty. Why are the Russians going to accept additional censorship of the test sites if we haven't even ratified the treaty? Okay. Well, well, I mean, yeah, great. Okay, we we go catch them testing in conformity with their interpretation of the treaty. What are you going to do about it? Okay. Third question. This is fine. Um, you have um, not addressed one of the points that I made in my opening about the value of the CTBT even before entering into force of providing us with leadership credibility. As you know from 2005 at the NPT conference, uh, this was an important issue for some states. It wasn't the only issue that divided countries, but it was one of the issues. Um, if you're not proposing to the United States for new nuclear weapons testing, and I haven't heard you say that in the near term or the medium term, uh, what tangible security benefits do we accrue if the United States does not ratify the CTB? Um, I agree that there need to be reasons to ratify a treaty, as you said in your opening. That was your threshold question. But we also need reasons not to do things all right, that are clearly on the agenda, that are on the diplomatic agenda internationally. Um, how do you propose that the United States regains its leadership credibility and non-proliferation and builds international support absent CTB ratification at this very crucial juncture in the history of the nuclear non-proliferation effort? To reiterate what I said at the outset, we need, I believe the United States needs to be satisfied with this treaty is in our interest. Um, I think the thrust of the argument you've just made is maybe there's some flaws, maybe there's some problems, but Will, will make the rest of the world happy if we ratify this treaty. They'll like they'll like us more if we ratify. So that's that's the reason. That was your version of my argument, right? But, I, I, but I'm but I'm t I'm uh, boiling down what you said. And you said no, you, you no, said you said it's no, on. No, the, you're not. You said it's on the that's diplomatic. Your argument, Steve. Well, that's you your said argument. you said it's on the diplomatic agenda, so we have to deal with it, and um, we, we won't be able to regain our leadership. And that, you know that's uh, is it not you to, you need to regain our leadership. We need. What does that mean? We have to make them like us, okay? And we'll make them like us by ratifying this treaty. Uh, there are lots of things we could do that will make other countries happy. You know, we can give them all a lot of money. That'll make them happy. Uh, you know, we can. Uh, we'll, we have a deficit. We'll make we'll make a billion Chinese people happy by abandoning our defense commitment to Taiwan. 
uh, we, we will make a lot of Arabs happy by abandoning our, our commitments to Israel. Uh, we don't do things because they'll make us popular or because they'll be well received in the international audience. We, ha as I said at the outset, we do things when we judge that they advance our national interest. And you know, th this idea that you know, diplomatic agenda and regaining leadership. It's not worth regaining our leadership if, if we're if we're doing things that are that are contrary to our interests. All right. Uh, now cross examination switches. Three questions from the negative to the affirmative. Uh, again, we'll have an orange timer uh, in an attempt to maintain contact restraints. I just. Okay. Um, let, let, let me let me do this in reverse order to what I had intended. Um, you know, a lot of the um, a lot of the debate, you know, particularly in the Obama administration, is really on this point that, that Adele just raised that. Uh, you know, we, America's lost its leadership in, in arms control and non-proliferation, and you know, that's why we're having so much trouble with Iran and North Korea. And um, if, we, if we want to solve the problem of nuclear proliferation, and, and you know, I think Joe and I may disagree about the street, but I think actually you and I agree with that profound significance of dealing with the problem uh, of nuclear proliferation. Um, and, and I think we, we find ourselves in debates with lots of other people about how high priority that is and what other interests of the U.S. we should be prepared to, to sacrifice in order to promote nuclear proliferation. So, I mean, there is actually a fundamental meeting of the minds, I think, uh, between uh, Daryl and me on the more basic issue here. But time and again, in the current debate, you see this contention that uh, we need to ratify the CTBT as a token of our new commitment to the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, to, to uh, International, international sentiment uh, in this area, and this you know the whole uh, you know, world free of nuclear weapons concept is, uh, is is really tied into this concept, and the pre the premise is that we'll make greater greater headway against the proliferators if we, if we do things like ratify the CCTV. The uh, there are two ways that could be true. One way would be true it would be true is if countries like Iran and North Korea would be so impressed by our ratification of the CTBT and you know, other, you know, our start extension agreement and you know, other things that we did uh, in, the nuclear non in the nuclear disarmament area. They'd be so impressed by that that they would decide, you know, we're not really interested in nuclear weapons after all. We're abandoning our program. There may be some people who actually believe that. Uh, I don't know whether you do. I, I think it's ludicrous. I, I think Iran and North Korea don't really, you know, what they're doing in the nuclear area. I don't, right. so we can move on to that. Okay. Okay. You, you, I mean, you don't think that, or you? And that's not the, that's that's not the okay. argument that I've been making. Okay, then the second argument, the other argument would be uh, that we'll be able to better put together an international coalition, build an international consensus, and bring pressure to bear on, on the outliers, the Iran's and North Koreas. Uh, and I take it that's, that's the view you subscribe to. Um, if we provide leadership, then we, we, what we have is a lack of followership, and we gain followership leadership on things like CCTV. Right? So, well, I'll describe it in my own words, but the, the premise of that argument is uh, essentially there are a bunch of countries out there that are prepared to do more, to confront Iran and North Korea, to strengthen the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, to you know, come up with penalties for uh, countries that violate the NPT, uh, to uh, come up with new international norms, uh, banning further spread of sensitive nuclear technologies like enrichment and reprocessing. Uh, all those countries are sitting out there, they're waiting to do that, but they're holding back because they're mad at, at the nuclear weapons policies of the United States and, and the other members, uh, the other nuclear weapon states. Uh, so I guess my first question is, is to test this hypothesis. Specifically, which countries are sitting out there waiting to do more and prepared to do more? At, at, you mentioned the, the 2010 review conference. Uh, which countries are are going to do more at the 2010 conference uh, with regards to penalties for violation of the treaty, penalties for withdrawal, restrictions on enrichment and reprocessing, uh, and, and specifically what 
what things will they agree to that, that they're not prepared to agree to in the absence of, of U.S. ratification with the CPPs? All right. Well, that's a good question, but as you know, you've been a representative of the United States at the NPT RevCon. I mean, you can't answer this question um, in one minute. We're supposed to be doing this. Um, but if the United States pursues, and we've already begun pursuing reconsideration or ratification of the CPP, if we reaffirm the uh, commitments that were made in 1995 when the treaty was extended uh, indefinitely, uh, very much on the basis of, of the commitments made by the weapon states on disarmament and on nonproliferation and, and other issues, uh, and at the 2000 Review Conference, we've got a chance to test whether this hypothesis works. And I think we have some evidence already. Last week, as you know, on the, s the third day of the NPT PropCom, uh, the states' parties agreed for the first time in a decade to an agenda for the 2010 Review Conference. Now, for most people on the street in Washington, D.C. or Peoria, that doesn't sound very exciting, but uh, it is essential to doing the hard work that we need to do to limit the spread of enrichment technologies, to get universal support for the additional protocol, to win the support of these other countries, the South Africans, the Brazils, uh, the other states in the Middle East, Russia and China to some extent, uh, to put pressure on, more pressure on the states that are not complying with their safeguards responsibility. So we're going to be able to test this proposition. We now have a chance to strengthen the treaty at the 2010 Review Conference. Um, uh, you know, this is soft power. One cannot list off exactly what the Egyptians and the Mexicans are going to do. But now we have a chance to test that, that hypothesis. And the evidence is already in that this kind of approach produces results. The results came in last week at the truck. Um, okay, well, well, I guess what I haven't heard is you suggesting specific countries that are holding back on, on things that are important to the global non-proliferation agenda that they would be prepared to do specific, specific things that specific countries would do uh, following CTB ratification by the United States if they're not prepared to do that. You want me to say we're going to test this, right? But that, I mean, that's not exactly a union endorsement of the, of the concept. Uh, what were your priorities in 2005 that you didn't introduce to okay, the U.S. delegation? I mean, those are the same kinds of issues we're going to pursue. It's five years later, okay? I'm not in the delegation at the moment. It's the conference is still going on. The work will go on for months, okay? Um, but as you know, I mean, the United States, Republican, Democratic administration has been seeking to get the additional protocol universalized, okay? We need to build support for new measures to make sure that states can withdraw from the treaty and not, uh, and continue to benefit from peaceful uses if they have violated safeguards. Um, these are the kinds of things we need more support on. There are other things we need more support on outside of the context of the NPT, okay? Well, I'm here to predict as the head of the U.S. delegation in the 2005 review conference that we're not, no matter how many CTBTs we ratify, no matter how low uh, we go in our deployed nuclear forces and the start follow-on agreement, you're not going to get these things at the NPT review conference. Uh, the 2005 NPT review conference was wrecked by Egypt. And Contrary to all the suggestions that you'll hear in the public discourse, Egypt wrecked that conference not because of any unhappiness on their part with the nuclear policy of the United States or Russia or China or the nuclear weapons states. The thing they're really upset about is Israel. And uh, until Israel is, uh, if Egypt is among the countries that hasn't ratified the CTBT. I mean, they, they aren't that enthusiastic about this treaty. But they're single-minded about the fact that Israel is not in the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. And, I, I, will, I, will, I will make this prediction. Any success achieved uh, at the 2010 Review Conference will come at the price of breaking Israel down on issues that, that Israel holds dear. And uh, you know, that's, a, that's a separate discussion, but it really has nothing to do with the nuclear weapons policy of the United States. And if the Obama administration wants to go break Israel's arm on, on some of these issues, they can do that and probably achieve the same outcome at the review conference as they would be able to achieve in the absence of doing anything with the CPPT. Okay. Um, 
Chris and Clark, if you're still here, I mean, the next topic for these debates ought to be what we need to do at the 2010 MPP Review Conference. But I'm making a simple point, um, which is that, you know, we are going to be in a position to test um, how much uh, we can bring other countries along. But we can only do that if, you know, we are moving forward on a treaty that is in our own national security interest. We're not testing. Uh, it seems, it's, as I said before, it's self-defeating to reject a treaty that bans something that we have decided we don't need to do. And our experts, there's no disagreement from our experts uh, about the fact that we can maintain the arsenal without nuclear weapons testing into the indefinite future. I, I think uh, there's so profound disagreement among experts about whether we can do that into, into the indefinite future. Can okay, so I, I, I think we, we, we've exhausted we, this topic. We've one minute on this, okay. on this question, so. Okay. Can I move on to my yes, second question? Um, the, um, in, in my remarks, I touched on the, the entry into force problem in this treaty. And uh, I made the assertion that uh, this treaty will not enter into force by its terms. Um, I guess I, I'd like to draw Daryl out on this. Uh, am, I, am I right about that, or do you actually believe that countries like Egypt, Israel, India, Pakistan, Iran, North Korea can be persuaded? ratify, and if so, what's your strategy for getting them in? And, and by the way, this isn't just my question. That, that was another homework assignment that the Strategic Posture Commission gave the Obama administration. They said, don't send this treaty to the Senate without presenting a credible plan to achieve entry into force, i.e. persuade those six countries to ratify. So um, maybe I'll put that, <laughs> what, what's your credible plan, that you, the credible plan that you would suggest to the Obama administration for uh, Persuading all right, well, your question, right. first of all, I mean, your question assumes that, you know, entry into force of the treaty and ratification by the 44 states and annex to the treaty um, is uh, the only benefit uh, for this treaty. The first thing that, you know, I, what I stated in my opening comments is that there is value for the United States with respect to non-proliferation leadership, putting pressure on other states not to test. Um, having the opportunity to uh, pursue new kinds of uh, transparency measures at test sites before entering the force. If the United States ratifies the CPP, there are benefits for U.S. ratification of the CPP short of entering the force. Okay. That said, the, the Article 14 entering the force provision is extraordinarily difficult. There's a long set of reasons why it came out to be that way. I'm disappointed with it too. Uh, but it is what it is. And uh, I agree, we do need to have a diplomatic strategy. I've been working for some time to get the states who are supportive of the CPPP uh, to pursue a strategy more vigorously. One of the huge problems is that the United States has been on the sidelines, and not just on the sidelines, the United States has been working in the other direction. Uh, so, I mean, I think the thing that we've got to you know, ask ourselves when we're, we're talking about the CTPP, the value of ratification, is what kind of role does the United States play in the international security environment, in the non-proliferation struggle? Uh, we are a leader, right? And we are, from the White House, saying we're not going to look at the CPP. Um, we are going to have a hell of a time convincing other countries, first of all, they shouldn't test. We're going to have a hard time making accusations and following up on them if we believe countries are testing. Um, and we're, we're leaving the door open for the renewal of testing by, by certain states and the pursuit of new uh, capabilities by, by states that could harm us in the future. So it seems to me that you know, despite the difficulties, um, the only way that we're going to achieve entry into force and to create this domino effect is with U.S. ratification. China, I think, and the, and the commission, uh, the pro side, uh, says, uh, I think the word is, you know, believes it will, um, uh, ratify if the United States does. That is going to have a powerful effect on India and Pakistan. Yes, the Indians uh, have an allergy about the, the Conference of Test Ban Treaty, not uh, made any better uh, by the fact that the Bush administration um, pursued the, the uh, U.S.-Indian nuclear deal. Nonetheless, the Indians have said that they're not going to be the last states to block entry into force of the CPPP. Pakistan will probably do what India does. Uh, Indonesia, as you said, is probably one of the easier states to convince. 
Uh, Egypt will be difficult, but Egypt's decision is going to be linked to Israel's. The United States uh, is known to have influence over Israel. Uh, and you seem to be suggesting that the Obama administration is going to be breaking arms with Israel for some reason. I don't know where that's coming from. But I think the United States and Israel are going to continue to work closely in that cooperation. Um, I have had signals from Israeli diplomats that they're rethinking the CPT in light of the fact that the United States is now rethinking the CPT. Um, so, I mean, I think there is a path forward. It's going to take leadership. But leadership on this subject begins with ratification by the United States. Uh, I think the argument I just heard is the one that I predicted we would hear, which is the way to bring these countries in is for the United States to ratify no all follow suit. Uh, my my uh, understanding from having uh, worked this issue some is that it's never more that simple. And uh, some of these countries have very profound uh, reservations about the CTPT, and they're not, not going to be addressed uh, just because the United States acts. And uh, if, for instance, in the case of Iran, yeah, I think we could pay a price to get Iran's uh, ratification. Uh, it's not a price I'm prepared to pay. But, but let me just. Uh, well, let me I, just I, I, Steve, I am not yeah. making that point. But, but, that is but, a ridiculous but, point. That that you, you seem to be suggesting that that uh, proponents of the CPD, such as myself, are going to say, "Oh, Iran, uh, please ratify the CPD. We'll let you go on all of your secret uh, activities." That's ridiculous. Okay. Right, right. My point was much different. I mean, I agree with you that Iran is pursuing activities that are going to give it the capability to make nuclear weapons. Uh, if uh, they are not curtailed or stopped, uh, there are questions about this program. We should be looking for every single way we can to put the spotlight on what it's doing, to highlight whether or not this program is peaceful or not. Um, you disagree. I happen to think the CPD can have value in highlighting whether that program is peaceful or not and convincing the other countries we need to convince to put more pressure on Iran. With regard to Iran, I'm, I'm actually reassured to hear that uh, that Daryl would not be prepared to trade concessions to Iran on the, the nuclear weapons program uh, for Iranian ratification of the CTBT. Um, let me just say, given the high level of enthusiasm uh, reporting on desperation uh, in some quarters for progress in CTBT, I'm not sure that answer is the answer we've received uh, from all proponents of the CTBT. And, I, and I'm, I'm speaking less about in, in America than in other places in the world. Uh, but I really do think, uh, God forbid, the America under just Iran is standing in the way because uh, you, you want to see uh, divisions between us and our European allies about you know, what sort of concessions we, we should be prepared to make to Iran to uh, achieve uh, a solution to the, 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 the diplomatic standoff, fold the CTBT into, into the mix, and, and uh, you may well expand those cleavages. Uh, we get one more question. One or? more. Okay. Try to keep it quick. The uh, it's not possible. One, one of the recommendations, is, 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 as we've noted, of the Strategic Posture Commission report is that there should be an agreed statement. The, the Obama administration should give an agreed statement among the P5 uh, about uh, the, how the treaties be interpreted before they ask the, the Senate to approve it. And, let me just say parenthetically, that recommendation doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because um, the, as, I, as I explained earlier, it's, it's all of the countries that are allowed to have nuclear weapons uh, whose compliance with this treaty we need to worry about, not just the P5. And so why, why they recommended get an agreed statement among the P5 but, it, but allow other countries not in the NPT today uh, to adopt the Russian interpretation they ratify. I'm not sure why you would, in other words, I'm not sure why you'd want it to be a P5 agreement as opposed to an agreement among the P5 plus India, Pakistan, Israel, North Korea, the countries outside of the NPT. Uh, there, there must be some explanation for that. I, I, I don't know what it is, but I, I'm not persuaded that that's actually a sufficient solution. Uh, but it is what it is. And so my first question to you is, I mean, Gerald, are, are, are you here to predict to us confidently that um, this is not a meaningful obstacle, and um, it should be easy and short order for the Obama administration to uh, procure P5 agreement on this. Uh, and the follow-up question to that, uh, should that prove impossible for whatever reason? Um, should, should there not be a P5 agreement on, on what, what is actually prohibited under the treaty? 
would, would you personally advocate going forward with Senate ratification even in the absence, uh, I think at that point it would be manifest, the, the divergent interpretations of what's prohibited. Uh, would you advocate going forward with U.S. ratification in that Well, first of all, I mean, you're, you're clearly questioning the strategic posture commission, <laughs> <laughs> which I was doing before too, so I'm glad we're both doing it. We should, we should be critical thinkers here in Washington and not accept everything we hear from the, um, the higher-ups. Um, you know, your question assumes that there is a problem. We discussed this before. Uh, what I'm pointing out is that there is understanding that when the treaty says uh, states shall not undertake activities involving nuclear test explosions, uh, that means all nuclear test explosions. Um, the negotiators in the 1994 to 1996 period, if you look at the negotiating records, if you read the history of the negotiations, which one of my colleagues here, uh, Jennifer McPhee, was uh, helped write, there was a deliberate decision uh, not to define prohibited and permitted activities. Why? Because the United States did not want to allow a loophole to be created by some creative, lawyerly interpretation of what permitted prohibited activities were. So the decision was that we should uh, ban all nuclear test explosions. Furthermore, in 1995, when the United States was trying to make up its decision about whether it should engage in uh, a zero-yield nuclear uh, test ban treaty or it should pursue a limited uh, threshold treaty, um, the, the Jason group was asked to do a study on whether very low-yield nuclear test explosions were useful to the United States. We made the decision then that we did not need very low yield hydronuclear tests of four pounds or less because the only use for those kinds of hydronuclear experiments is for one point safety. All of our nuclear weapons are one point safe. That means a bullet can't be fired at it and it will explode, something like that. Um, it was also determined that tests below about um, uh, 500 tons were also not militarily useful to the United States because it would not enable us to conduct boosted uh, tests of the second stage of thermonuclear weapons. So we decided that it is not in our interest. We pursued a treaty, and we got a treaty that bans all nuclear weapon test explosions. The Russians, as, as I said before, have made it clear that this is their position too. Um, in 2000, in January of 2000, uh, the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, Director of Security Affairs and Disarmament Issues, Yuri S. Kafala, said, and I quote, qualitative modernization of nuclear weapons is the only possible, is only possible through full-scale and hydronuclear tests with the emission of fissile energy, comma, the carrying out of which directly contradicts the CTD. All right, so that's a Russian speaking English. It's not elegant, but the meaning is clear. Okay, hydronuclear tests are prohibited. So, is a P5 uh, statement necessary? No. Is that something that we might pursue in order to clarify the misconception that the skeptics continue to perpetuate? Sure, I'd be willing to see what we can achieve by having the Russians reiterate their position or the Chinese reiterate their position. Uh, but from my perspective, this issue was settled a decade ago, and I'm not sure why you or the Posture Commission continues to make this assertion in light of it. All right, I'm going to try to expedite this next section uh, really quickly, and uh, given how junior I am, perhaps the responses can be very quick. Uh, my question to Daryl briefly is uh, just related to some of the, you know, a lot of the arguments as to how there's very, you know, the degree of verification might be unknown, things, you know, the Strategic Foster Commission says there's a, quote, near zero chance that it enters into force, et cetera, et cetera. At what point uh, is it possible that the CTBT becomes arms control for the sake of arms control and that it could give us credibility, but that it could become uh, perhaps a diplomatic quagmire as, you know, we try to persuade other states and we become so locked up trying to deal with the CTBT that it ultimately does not yield as much value as the time we invest in it. Well, I mean, we have capable diplomats at the State Department. Uh, many of them are capable of multitasking. I mean, I, I think, um, uh, it is possible to pursue U.S. ratification, achieve it, 
uh, and in the course of pursuing our non-proliferation diplomacy to try to win support for the other signatures and ratifications. I mean, as, as I said, there is value uh, to the United States from a security standpoint, a diplomatic standpoint, uh, a non-proliferation standpoint, if we ratify the treaty. Uh, entry into force uh, is going to be valuable, but there are benefits uh, before we get to that point. So that would be my short answer. Uh, cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> trying to trying to get back on time. Uh, Schrodinger, a question for you. Uh, the uh, sort of what's I guess informed my thinking as a college debater is sort of this concept of uh, what debaters like to call offense and defense, which is to say you have to have a reason uh, why something is not necessarily not adequate, but why it would be bad. Uh, and obviously, you somewhat disagree with that in your characterization of how Senate. Uh, how the Senate should, whether or not they should consider ratifying a treaty. My question is, uh, given that the United States uh, has a test moratorium, it seems like they will not be considering a testing option. Uh, what is the sort of, quote, offensive reason as to why the United States should not want to consider uh, ratifying the treaty if there are perhaps these extraneous uh, benefits or there's a chance that the treaty might do some good in being able to conduct tests, et cetera, even if it cannot completely do what it was set out to do. My, my first point in response to that is, if we decide that we actually want a permanent, comprehensive test ban treaty, uh, it'd be nice to have one. Uh, unfortunately, the treaty that it was negotiated or is presented to us uh, appears to have uh, some fundamental problems, including the fact that there's disagreement uh, among the parties as to what is prohibited. So uh, I think that by itself uh, <laughs> raises the question of you know, why, why ratify a flawed one if, uh, for your, and, and obviously if even Daryl can see this, this one is, is flawed in its entry into force mechanism, so we have to amend it in order to bring it into force because uh, it, it's never going to enter into force uh, by its terms. Um, on, the, on the question of uh, benefits of, um, of having this treaty, looking at the last 15 years, um, I see little evidence that this treaty has made much of a difference. Uh, the, uh, the, the P5 uh, have not tested nuclear weapons uh, since, since France did in 1996. Uh, I think they, they've all unilaterally maintained moratoriums, not because the treaty's enforced, but because they, they, they each reached an individual judgment that politically didn't make sense uh, for them to, to test. India and Pakistan tested in 1998. That's, I think actually maybe I should retract that this treaty's made no difference. I, I think there's a pretty decent case to be made that the reason India and Pakistan tested when they did uh, had to do with the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. They were fearful at that point that it was actually going to enter into force, and so they wanted to race forward and test before entering into force. Um, I think that, that, uh, that, that's a notion that uh, needs to at least be considered because uh, the, the, t the timing is interesting uh, when you look at that, because we all know India was right kicking and screaming to to uh, agree to this treaty, and uh, they, they still haven't signed it, but they, they agreed to let it go forward, and uh, quickly they're after testing the nuclear weapon. Uh, North Korea, I defy anybody to tell me that North Korea's test in 2006 would have happened differently with, with a CTBT in force or, or, or without. Uh, so wh I, I think setting aside India, set aside North Korea, set aside India and Pakistan, uh, for the P5, uh, why, why are they all not testing? I think there may actually be the a more persuasive uh, explanation of what's going on is um, none of them want the other ones to test. And uh, you, you basically have a, a, a standoff. Uh, and, and each one is deterred by the threat that if they test, the, rea the reaction of, one of, the, of the other P5 will be that they'll, they'll resume testing as well. And uh, that may actually be a more effective uh, deterrent than, than having a a treaty that additional countries have ratified, but of course still hasn't entered into force because uh, because of its effective entry into force mechanism. Okay, we've got closing statements. Uh, three minutes per side. Uh. Well, I think just in that last comment um, that Steve made, I think he made a, a very important point in favor of U.S. ratification of CTV. Uh, why isn't there nuclear testing today? 
the United States engaged in a nuclear test moratorium in 1992 uh, after the Russians had uh, declared a unilateral moratorium. The negotiations began a couple years later. Uh, there was pressure on the negotiators at the CD through the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference in 95. Get it done by 1996. That is part of the deal for the extension of the NPT. There is an undeniable connection between those two. And after that, uh, the P5 all signed the Conference of Testing Treaty. No one wants others to test. The Indians and the Pakistanis are not testing today, probably because there is a global nuclear test norm that the CTBT is essential to reinforce. Over time, we're going to see some country, and we're not talking about North Korea, because the North Koreans will do whatever they want right now, uh, conduct nuclear test explosions if this treaty uh, does not enter into force. Now, you've heard us talk back and forth about whether it is militarily significant, if, if militarily significant cheating in the CTB can be detected with high confidence. We've talked about whether the U.S. stockpile can be maintained into the future, whether a total ban on testing, on testing constrains the nuclear weapons development activities of other states, and whether the CTB provides the United States and non-proliferation leadership credibility. My answer, and I think we'll hear more about this in the months ahead, is an emphatic yes. There is a growing list of bipartisan experts and former government officials who agree with this assessment on the Conference of Testing Treaty. We all in the coming months are going to have a responsibility to make sure that this debate is uh, thorough, that it is based on the facts, that we, we, we have a good back and forth, and this has been a very good back and forth, um, and that we have open minds and that we're not clinging to the talking points from a decade ago. But I think there's a more fundamental issue to consider as we go into this debate. Um, this, by ratifying the CTBT, we are going to be pledging our support for an international agreement that bans an activity that we unilaterally halted 17 years ago. Testing is no longer technically or militarily useful in maintaining the U.S. nuclear arsenal, nor is there any military requirement to conduct nuclear tests to develop new types of nuclear weapons. On the other hand, the absence of the CTB and the monitoring inspection regime that it would create could help other states, allow other states to prove new types of more sophisticated nuclear weapons. So, I mean, the choice here, I think, is, is clear. A world without nuclear testing is a safer world. And as President Obama said uh, back in April, after five decades of talks, it is time for the testing of nuclear weapons to finally be banned. So, I, in my view, the United States stands to lose nothing and gains much, uh, an important constraint on the weapons capabilities of other countries that could pose a threat to our security in the decades ahead. And our failure to ratify denies us the leverage we need. Steve doesn't believe this is useful leverage, but I think it's valuable leverage that we need to prod other nations to join the treaty and refrain from testing. And by denying ratification, by not ratifying, we're denying ourselves the ability to persuade others uh, to repair the battered non-proliferation treaty. So this issue, this treaty, is an important chance, not the only, it's not the be-all and end-all, but it is an important chance uh, to take the lead rather than to stand in the way of progress towards reducing the nuclear threat. The argument we've just heard is that uh, the, the the comprehensive test ban imposes no costs on the United States and it would provide benefits, so why not accept the benefits? Let, let me be very blunt about something. For a nuclear weapon state, that is a country that has nuclear weapons and intends to have them for the foreseeable future, and, and I'm not being hawk here when I say this, President Obama said that he, doesn't, he thinks we're going to have nuclear weapons in the United States for the rest of his lifetime, and he wants to abolish them. But, uh, for a country that's going, going to have nuclear weapons for the rest of President Obama's lifetime and, and potentially well beyond that, uh, the right, the ability to test those nuclear weapons for their safety and their reliability is an extremely valuable right. I'm going to draw an analogy here, and uh, I can see at the outset it's an imperfect analogy. I, I can't think of a perfect analogy, but, but I think it illustrates the point. 
think of nuclear weapons as, as some other sophisticated man-made object, an automobile. Uh, what, 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 the what the comprehensive test ban says is put your car on blocks. Don't ever start it up. You're, you're, allowed, to, you're allowed to do all that. You know, we'll give you supercomputers to do modeling and, and you know, you can tinker under the hood all you want. You're just not, you can't turn the ignition. You leave it on blocks. And, oh, by the way, your national security, your national survival may depend on your ability to start that car at some point when you really need it to start. But rely on science, rely on, on, uh, on, on, on testing and, and, and on uh, maintenance and, and upkeep to assure yourself that that car, when you turn the key, when you really need it, it'll start. And for other people to be persuaded that that's true, too, because you, you're trying to assure allies that you have a nuclear deterrent that protects them against the risks that they face. If I had an automobile and I was being asked to put it on blocks and be assured and, and you know, spend a lot of money to maintain it, but never start it, and it, we want you to be confident that if you ever had to start it, it would start. How many years am I prepared to do that? And, and, and be confident that because of all the testing and monitoring and modeling, uh, that the car will really start when I, when I turn the key. You know, a year, two years, five years, 10 years, 17 years. That's where we are now. Uh, but you know, I, I don't know how long President Obama will live, but at the end of his lifetime, uh, if the CTBT is in force, uh, we, we will not have turned that ignition. And maybe for decades past that, we will not have turned that ignition. And Maybe, maybe we can live with that. Our I mean, experts will tell us we can. But I'm, I'm telling you, giving up that right to be able to turn the key in a test, to reassure yourself that it really does work, and that that, that car who, on, on which you depend potentially for your survival will be there for you when you need it, uh, th that right is, is of great value to you. And uh, it is not cost-free to give it up. And at a minimum, if you are going to give it up, I think you're entitled to expect that everyone else in the world gives it up too. And as I said, that will be one of the questions. Has everyone else in the world actually given up this right? Or are there divergent interpretations of this treaty such that we give up that right to test our car, but others haven't? I, I think that, that that's an important consideration in this debate. It's not cost-free to nuclear weapon states. This, this is a valuable right, and, and this treaty asks us to give it up. The, to make a, a further point, I'm going to continue my analogy with cars. Um, okay, you, you, but I think this will, this will contribute to the debate. You heard Daryl say, you know, low yield nuclear testing, it's not militarily significant. Our experts looked at it. We don't need to test nuclear weapons down, I forget what level you said, but below, what, 500? You know, for, for the United States, we don't need, we don't need to test. Um, and upon that basis, he concludes I mean, that that's part of the evidence for that he would cite for the proposition that if there is testing going on, it's not militarily significant or militarily useful. In this regard, very little appreciated fact, there are enormous differences between the way the United States structured its nuclear weapons complex and the way the Soviet Union structured its nuclear weapons complex. We, our model, with car analogy. We built Mercedes-Benz. We built nuclear weapons design, warheads designed to last. And today we're not building anymore. Okay. We're relying on the old ones that are 17 years old. Or at least 17 years old, much older in most cases. And we don't propose to rebuild them. Actually, there, there are proposals to come up with a new warhead that, um, you know, for, for, uh, and th those proposals are being rejected. So you know, it looks like we're going to continue to rely on the Mercedes-Benz that we built to last for a really long time. Russia never built Mercedes-Benz. They built Yugo, Hyundai, or, or Volga. Uh, they, they don't purport to rely on the same weapons for decades. They constantly recycle them. They, they have a shelf life. So Russia is continuing to remanufacture. And they, if you want to project to the end of President Obama's lifetime, there's no expectation in Moscow that at the end of President Obama's lifetime, the nuclear weapons that they're deploying on their missiles are the same ones that have been there since 1980. 
that, that was never the, that was never their approach to uh, how to, to construct their nuclear weapons complex. And so the fact that for the United States certain things are true with respect to low yield testing, it, that's not necessarily true for other countries who have structured their nuclear weapons complexes and, and their approach to the whole nuclear enterprise. Then we're going to have to cut things off uh, substantially over time. There's an open bar. Uh, it shouldn't be utilized. Uh, we thank everyone for coming. Uh, we apologize that we didn't get the Q&A session. Uh, perhaps if the guests are here for a second, you can ask them. We'll see. Uh, big round of applause for our guests.